Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the final presentation. Our presentation will be on a lot of current issues that you've probably seen in the news. And hopefully, uh, as our Prezi loads, uh, we'll be able to kind of move through those. Um, we've divided them into two main topics, uh, environmental law topics that impact ag, and then general ag law topics. So we'll start with the environmental law topics. The first one is the Food and Water Watch v. USDA case. Um, this complaint is a very recent one that um, is about an FSA guaranteed loan of a poultry operation on the eastern shore here in Maryland. So it's very current um, and relevant to the state of Maryland. It's from the federal, it's, it was filed in the uh, DC District Court um, recently. And it's challenging um, FSA's environmental assessment and finding of no significant impact of the approval of that guaranteed loan and um, the running of that uh, poultry um, operation. Um, they're saying that it violated a couple of laws, um, specifically the National Environmental Policy Act. So this act actually requires that all federal agencies um, assess the environmental impact of any proposed action um, that they're going to take that will significantly impact the human environment. And with that, um, agencies are given the authority to do something called an environmental assessment to determine whether they need either an environmental impact statement or a finding of no significant impact statement. So um, with that, there are a couple of regulations um, related to uh, both um, the Council on Environmental Quality and then the FSA has their own regulations related to NEPA. So with the USDA regulations, um, there's a requirement that they analyze in their environmental assessment um, whether or not there are feasible alternatives, so different location, design, project, or um, no project whether or not um, there's an analysis of the project's impact on um, air quality, water quality, or um, the natural environment surrounding it, including wildlife. And then they also need to analyze um, some mitigation measurements that could be taken. So here, in this case, um, it was challenged that the environmental assessment did not adequately address um, these regulations as well as uh, the Council on Environment, uh, Environmental Quality Regulations that um, require that you consider all past, present, and reasonably foreseeable um, future actions. So here, like I mentioned, um, with the no feasible alternatives, uh, Food and Water Watch is uh, arguing that they did not consider anything besides the current location and a no project. They did not analyze different locations or alternative projects. They're also saying um, that the air quality analysis um, was not adequate. The water quality analysis failed to address, um, I believe, groundwater, and it did not adequately address the surface water analysis. And then um, on the natural environment component, they are uh, complaining uh, that the environmental assessment did not address uh, several things, but specifically um, a report from uh, the National U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife um, Agency that said this project would impact a number of migratory birds and that the analysis um, of mitigation measures um, was not adequate as well as the fact that they didn't address things um, into the future and the overall impact in the entire community. The next uh, hot issue of this year um, is actually something that started back in 2015 in uh, Des Moines, Iowa. This is a case that was filed by the Des Moines Water Works, which is actually the largest um, water supplier in Iowa. And what they challenged um, specifically, they challenged numerous claims, but the biggest one was the fact that um, drainage field tiles um, they claimed should be covered under the Clean Water Act as point sources. And this was brought about um, in part because of a high level of nitrates that they were um, receiving into their facility and they uh, were concerned um, that they wouldn't be able to meet um, the national safe drinking uh, water requirements. So they sued um, that the drainage, of course, um, should have a national pollution discharge elimination system permit. 
under the Clean Water Act. Um, they also sued under numerous state law claims as well as state and federal uh, constitutional claims. And on those state law issues, um, they're suing here, the defendant is the drainage districts, which are actually run by the County Board of Supervisors. And this was the big issue, is who the defendant was in this case. So the federal district court actually uh, took this to the Iowa Supreme Court instead and asked them to decide um, some standing issues with the state law claims. And the Iowa Supreme Court actually held um, that you cannot sue drainage districts um, under state law and under numerous um, other cases from the Supreme Court for about a century that drainage districts um, are immune from um, lawsuits that uh, require certain damages to be paid. And that also this was outside the scope of their authority. So um, under Iowa state law, they are only uh, authorized to um, implement and manage these districts. They have no authority to require farmers to reduce um, the nitrates that they are um, plant placing um, onto the field and through the drainage districts uh, field tiles. And so um, the Iowa Supreme Court held that uh, they dismissed the case and the federal district court then um, said that they would agree with the Iowa Supreme Court and they dismissed the case as well. And uh, the Des Moines uh, Water Works Board recently voted that they will not appeal the case. Um, one issue that wasn't decided was whether or not drainage field tiles are a uh, point source under the Clean Water Act. Another uh, very hot issue um, that's very recent is uh, the use of the new dicamba products. Um, and there have been a number of uh, state laws and lawsuits surrounding um, this issue across the U.S. So there has been a number of damage from the use of these brand new dicamba products. Um, in 2015, Monsanto released a uh, tolerant soybean and cotton seeds. Um, that were tolerant to these new dicamba products, but the new dicamba actually wasn't approved by the EPA until the end of the growing season in November of 2016. So there were a few um, damage reports in 2015, more in 2016, and then they significantly increased in 2017. And here is a map um, from the University of Missouri's um, wheat scientist that shows the damage and which states they're in. Uh, Arkansas and Missouri have received uh, the most damage here, um, and they uh, have seen an increase from about two dozen complaints from 2016 to in the 300s and almost 1,000 in Arkansas for this year. So with these new Canva products, um, they have new labels and regulations, and so for 2017, uh, these products had very strict um, regulations. You could not use them uh, if, for example, um, rain was going to occur within uh, 24 hours of application. You can't use them if the wind speeds are less than three miles an hour, um, if they are greater than 15 miles an hour, if it's between 10 and 15 miles an hour. Uh, you cannot use um, the product if it's blowing towards a sensitive crop, so a non-tolerant crop, you cannot use it. Um, and this was um, part of the controversy. Um, there were three main products, uh, DuPont and Monsanto's, both followed those same regulations. And then BASF's new dicamba product actually had a little more lax regulations, so it was whether rain was uh, occurring within the next four hours, um, and then also they had a little less uh, buffer requirements uh, compared to the Monsanto and DuPont products, as well as um, they allowed, um, if it was under three miles an hour, you could spray it if there wasn't a temperature inversion. So a little bit different there. Um, and because of the damage and all of the legal issues that have arisen from this, uh, the EPA is actually going to issue new regulations that they worked with the industry and State Department of Ags for uh, the 2018 season. So with those, um, you will not be able to spray it. Um, it's over 10 miles an hour with the wind. You won't be able to spray it during certain times of the day, so there'll be some restrictions on daylight with that. 
um, and certain hours. And then every single um, person who applies this will have to go through mandatory training, which was not required this past year. So there will be some mandatory re training requirements as well. Uh, so like I mentioned, um, several states have uh, issued some laws and regulations around this. Um, so in Missouri, they actually banned the product and then uh, they um, halted that ban. So they implied more restrictions, uh, stricter training. They also increased the fines for misuse. In Arkansas, um, they actually had banned Monsanto's product for 2017. So BASF's product was the only one um, that was allowed for the 2017 growing season. And Monsanto um, and Arkansas are in a legal battle right now. Uh, the Arkansas State Plant Board, which regulates their new dicamba products and new pesticides um, in the state of Arkansas, has actually um, voted to move forward with a ban um, during the growing season. So I believe it's after April 16th to about October 31st. Uh, you wouldn't be able to use the product in the state of Arkansas. And Monsanto has sued, um, one, because their product was not approved in 2017, and now with the ban, if it does move forward through um, their administrative approval process, uh, no product will be allowed during that growing season. And Monsanto is arguing in this case that the state plant board didn't comply with state law that requires them to base their decisions on sound science. And they're also arguing that's a violation of uh, their uh, constitutional right to due process, as well as a violation of the Commerce Clause. They're arguing that there's an unwritten rule in the state of Arkansas that their um, university uh, researchers are the only ones who can, um, the only science that they'll consider as a state plant board, but this is an, an official rule. So this lawsuit has been filed. There was also a lawsuit that was filed um, this week, um, some farmers in the state of Arkansas are suing the state plant board for banning the product during the growing season. They wanted the date to um, end May 25th, so they wanted to be able to spray it throughout the month of May. Um, so we'll see uh, where those lawsuits progress. And that might be um, kind of something for other state departments of ag. I'm sure they're watching that closely to see as they make their decisions because there are also other options that states have. So um, Department of Ags can look at the different um, administrative regulations that they're authorized to do. Uh, under the federal law, uh, they can implement re more strict um, regulations on these products. And so several states did that um, for the 2017 year. Most of these states just required additional training and they uh, did not want um, the uh, product to be sprayed over 10 miles an hour. So those are things that will already be implemented in 2018. Um, so that'll probably do away with some of these state regulations. And then there's also, um, under the federal law, they're allowed to change the label to be stricter. So several states also chose that option as well. And there have also been a number of lawsuits against the companies for these products. Um, there's been, of course, more damage um, than has been seen before with dicamba. And so uh, there have been a number of class action lawsuits that have been filed, as well as individual farmers that have sued. Um, there was a peach farmer in Missouri who had significant damage from dicamba that sued the companies that released these products. Um, and then. There was a farmer in Illinois who did an individual lawsuit too, who grew non-tolerant soybeans and pumpkins. And with these lawsuits, they're claiming uh, numerous things. Most of the claims are state tort law claims, so negligence, strict liability. Um, but there are also some federal claims, um, like the Lanham Act, that it was false advertising, um, as well that the product was safe, as well as um, some Sherman Act claims that they're trying to monopolize the market because they're claiming that farmers now feel like they have to buy these uh, tolerant seeds or uh, their crops will be destroyed um, during the growing season. Uh, one of these cases I'll point out is different. Um, it's not farmers that receive damage, but this is a class action of farmers uh, that actually purchased the dicamba seeds. 
um, and the dicamba product, and then they claim since they could not use the product, specifically in Arkansas, uh, that they um, were, uh, they received some damages because their yields weren't as high, they modified their equipment to uh, meet the label requirements, and then they were unable to use the spray, and then they were unable to get a rebate on the spray. So that case um, is the B&L Farms case, that's a little bit different. Um, but the remaining of these, um, there are members um, and definitions as well as the years of which year the damage occurred. Um, like I said, damage has been reported since 2015. So I'm going to get a little, I'm going to move this up so people can hear me. Can everybody hear me? No. <laughs> Speak into it. Speak closer to it. It's going white to white. So I'm going to get a little local with this. We're going to go to Montgomery County. So how many people knew Montgomery County banned pesticides in 2015? Okay, most of you, good. Montgomery County Council passed this in 2015. They prohibited certain pesticides from being applied on both private and county-owned property. The idea was to prevent them from being applied for non-essential cosmetic purposes, if I remember correctly. They also created a whole new classification of pesticides to be used in the county. Um, the bill did contain an ag exemption, and the idea was, at least from what I remember, from what I read at the time, the idea was to protect those that could be easily injured by pesticides, children, the elderly, um, the list could go on, potentially. Um, that was sued by a group of, my mind just went blank, turf management companies and a few other people, and that came out through a district court ruling here recently, and I want to give a little background on this, because this will help when we talk about the issue as to why it was overturned here in a second. Um, looking at how these things are regulated on the federal and state level, under federal law, they're regulated under the Federal Insecticide, Rodicicide, and Fungicide Act, and I probably said that backwards, but it's FIFRA. Um, it requires all pesticides to be um, a licensed with EPA. They have to be registered, they have to have an approved label, and they go through and classify what are restricted use pesticides, those that the general public cannot buy without a license. State regulations, MDA has authority to kind of do this under two laws. Basically, all pesticides sold in the state have to be registered with the state. They have to carry a registered label. Um, there are differences between regular restricted and general use pesticides in the state. And finally, there were limitations on how they could be used around schools. They had to make schools aware when pesticides were going to be used before lawn companies did it. Um, children had to be made aware so parents could be made aware, that kind of thing. So how did the district court, or the circuit court, come out on this? I get my state courts confused sometimes. The state court looked at this and said it was preempted under this idea of implied preemption. They also looked at it from the standpoint of conflicts preemption. I'm not going to talk about conflicts preemption because the, dis or the circuit court didn't spend that much time on conflicts preemption, preemption. They spent more time on this implied preemption idea. The idea here was basically Maryland occupied the entire field of pesticide law. If we look at what Maryland does to this, Maryland, through MBA, regulates how pesticides are used in the state. Maryland sets the classifications for the pesticides. There was no room for the counties to do this. This was not a traditional area where counties got involved in historically. So they had seven factors they applied. Do not ask me to name all seven off the top of my head. I cannot remember them all. Today, it's Friday, guys. But seven or six out of seven weighed in favor of the state of Maryland. That preemption did exist in this case. The seventh factor that kind of weighed in the county's favor was the Express Powers Act. The court pointed out there was an argument that could be made for health, safety, and welfare that they could have the authority. But just the fact that six out of seven weighed against them, the court looked and said this is preempted. So where are we at with this right now? The Montgomery County Council has approved an appeal. I think they approved the appeal, the appeal either last month or the, in September. I can't remember exactly when. Um, we'll have to look and see what the Court of Special Appeals says, if anything, on this case next year. And the reason to bring this up is Maryland is not different in how we've come out in this so far, at least at the circuit court level. 
Um, other jurisdictions have looked at this. There's been Hawaii has three counties that have either banned pesticides or banned GMO applications. These have all been overturned on preemption. Oregon has a preemption case going on right now with a county pesticide ban. And I think there are two counties in California, if I remember correctly, that have banned pesticide applications. Those have never been challenged at this point. Those are the only ones that are kind of left alone. But for the most part, these things are usually overturned on a preemption challenge. And now we're going to turn to my favorite case from the whole week, and Holly's favorite case, and John's favorite case from the whole week, because this has caused us the most work for the week. Um, we have this emissions case that came down this year um, from the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. And to give a little bit of background on this, in 2008, EPA issued a final rule that basically exempted all animal operations from having to report under CERCLA, the Superfund law, and then IPCRA, which is the community's right to know law. These laws require when certain hazardous waste are released in reportable quantities, you have to report it to the National Response Center. And the National Response Center lets first responders and EPA know about these releases. Um, when the exemption went into place in 2008, it was challenged by various environmental and animal groups. Um, in 2010, the court granted a, stay, a request by EPA to go back and reevaluate the role. Fast forward to 2016, EPA did nothing to reevaluate this rule in the meantime. So we come back, the groups come back, they challenge to have it reopened and have the court looked at it, and that's where we're at today. So we look at this, was EPA able to set this exemption? So the idea was, could they set this exemption under state, or under CERCLA and under IPRA? I've moved to federal law, I guess, now. Um, in this case, the court ruled both statutes didn't give them authority. If you release in reportable quantities, you have to report it. There's this idea that potentially they could have said, ah, oh, it's so small, we'll never do anything about it under the de minimis doctrine. The court looked at that and said the public comments that came back undermined this argument because there were arguments made as to when EPA would actually act or first responders would want to know under these laws. So the court looked at this and weighed it more or less in favor of that. There was no ability to create this exemption. So where are we at now? And I have to point out, when Kelly told me we were going to use Prezi for this, I thought this was a good idea up until I found out GIFs did not work in Prezi. <laughs> but it was really awesome last night when we found out that the reporting deadline was no longer yesterday and I could just magically make changes and did not have to share that PowerPoint with anybody. It worked so much more efficiently. But as of right now, producers do not have to report anything that they're releasing to EPA or actually to the National Response Center at this time. They will have to at some point once the order from the court is final. Once they turn that in, they have 30 days. If they had already reported to the National Response Center, they don't have to report for 30 days, is my understanding as of right now. They will have to report to their regional EPA office within 30 days after that, and then every year they have to file a report. Now it's back to Kelly to talk about some of the ag issues. So um, the GYPSA rules are also something that have uh, recently been in the news. Um, the USDA decided to withdraw um, one of the main GYPSA rules um, that was implemented. So just a little background. Um, in 2008, uh, the Farm Bill mandated that uh, the Grain Inspection Packers and Stockyards Administration within the USDA write new rules and definitions related to the Packers and Stockyards Act. And specifically, um, they wanted them to focus on one section, um, Section 202B, um, which kind of talks about um, discrimination and giving certain advantages and disadvantages to producers. And so with this, um, the USDA GYPSA uh, wrote a rule for 2011, and then in 2012 um, and through 2015, uh, the Ag Appropriations Bill had a GYPSA writer in it, 
which is basically a language um, that prohibited the USDA from working on these rules and implementing these rules and enforcing these rules. Um, so the rules were never implemented. In 2016, uh, there was no GYPSA rider in the ag appropriations, so um, the USDA wrote a rule, and at the end of um, 2017, um, that rule was released. And so um, the USDA, uh, or the end of 2016, excuse me. And so um, with this rule, um, it was actually just recently uh, withdrawn, um, one of them um, from the USDA. It's known as the unfair practices and undue preferences um, rule. And with this rule, um, it defined not just um, the section on um, the disadvantages, advantages, um, and discrimination, but also one um, just about unjust and unfair practices in general. And so it defined um, several actions um, that can be taken where producers uh, could sue a contractor or a dealer um, based on uh, those certain actions. Historically, the courts have held that you have to show um, unfair competition to have a claim under the Packers and Stockyards Act. And with these new rules, um, it was kind of assumed that you would no longer have to show that competitive harm. And so uh, this was the main issue here. And so uh, the USDA, like I said, withdrew those rules recently. Um, but there is still a rule that they have not withdrawn. And that's the poultry grow ranking systems rule. That's still being considered. And that lists um, several things that the Secretary of Ag can still consider um, based on whether or not a poultry dealer has violated the Packers and Stockyards Act. So that will be something to watch here in the future to see if the USDA moves forward with that rule or if they withdraw that rule. So looking back at a case that was settled, hopefully here this year, is the Syngenta, Syngenta class action lawsuit. And to give a little bit of background on this, to give you a timeline for what happened. In 2010, Syngenta released this MIR-162 trait on the market. The trait was approved in all major markets except for China. At the time, China was not buying that much American corn. In 2012, 2013, the, well, 2012, 2013, the price of corn went up. Chinese started buying a lot more corn from us. Um, somewhere around 2013, they began to reject shipments of U.S. corn because they started finding this trait in their corn and it was unapproved to enter their market. Um, there are also stories out there that say the reason the Chinese did this is not because they found this trait, they were finding it well back in. 2012, when they initially started buying U.S. corn. The reason they did it is they entered into contracts when the prices were high. Corn prices dropped at that point. They could reject the corn and get out of the contracts real easy at that point. So there are some arguments out there that there was some getting out of bad situations. In 2015, U.S. corn growers who did not grow these varieties brought a suit against Syngenta. It was consolidated into a class action lawsuit in Kansas, and this year in June we had the first verdict in that involving the Kansas plaintiffs in that case, um, and that trial returned a verdict of $218 million more or less. That was exactly what the Kansas plaintiffs asked for. They did not ask for a penny less, and they didn't get a penny more. They got exactly what they asked for in that case. Um, in September of this year, the next trial started involving Minnesota class action plaintiffs, and that case, right in the middle of it, set Syngenta issued a statement that they had settled all claims. There are currently reports out there that these claims were settled for around $1.5 billion. We don't know any terms of the claims yet, but to put this in perspective, when we look at the, uh, the Kansas verdict, there was expert testimony in that trial that placed damages on the nationwide class as a whole, which Maryland would be a part of, at either three and a half billion to about four and a half billion dollars. So we're looking at potentially the settlement being less than what the estimated damages were for. So 
What are we doing right now? Well, currently we're waiting on terms of the settlement. The settlement terms have not been released since that news was made. I don't even know if it's $1.5 billion. That's just what has been reported in the media that somebody leaked. It could be more, it could be less. We don't know at this point. If growers are getting contacted by plaintiff's attorneys, they really don't have to respond to these plaintiff's attorneys because most of them are already a part of the class unless they opted out at this point. And they would have done that back in April and they would remember doing it because they had to send in a postcard to the district court at the time. Um, when those terms are released of the settlement, then they'll know what to do moving forward. It seems like it's going to be for about crop years 2013 to about 2000 to about this year is what the settlement looks like it will include. It may not include all those years. Again, I'm speculating up here as to what the terms of a settlement is I have not seen yet. And then to talk about ag-gag rulings, we've had quite a few of these rulings come down. Maryland is not a state with an ag-gag law, but it was a term coined by Mark Vinneman in a New York Times column. Um, I can't remember the year, but the idea behind these laws are they typically limit filming or photography on a farm without the consent of the owner prior to the filming taking place. The idea was to stop animal rights groups from coming on farms going undercover and reporting farming operations to then out farmers for potentially bad practices that employees were using. So where are we at with these? Idaho had a ruling in 2015 involving their ag gag law. The district court in Idaho found that it violated the First Amendment and the 14th Amendment. They are appealing that this year to the um, Ninth Circuit, and that was heard in April or in May. We still haven't heard if an opinion has been issued in that case. Other states where this has come up, Utah passed one. Um, it was found unconstitutional by the Utah um, District Court for violating the First Amendment. Wyoming passed a weird one. Wyoming's was not limited at protecting ag operations. It was protected to prevent people from environmental groups and other groups coming on private land to monitor environmental or take, um, do surveys for Endangered Species Act. So it's basically to limit that to where you couldn't come on any privately owned land to do these surveys unless you were given permission to do it. Um, the court ruled there also, or the Wyoming District Court actually ruled it did not violate the First Amendment. On appeal, the Tenth Circuit said it violated the First Amendment. So for the most part, these laws pretty much have been found all around to violate the First Amendment and limit free speech. And then on to the ho hobby drone laws, hobby drone regulations. These should also be the commercial drone regulations as well. Um, in 2015, FAA announced these regulations for how UAVs or drones were going to be used. This took about a year longer than what was expected by the FAA. Um, these regulations at the time required registration with FAA before utilizing and including a unique identifying number on the craft. This included all UAVs and all model aircraft. The thing to point out here is prior to these regulations going in place, federal law had exempted model aircraft and all hobby operators from having to register their aircraft with FAA. Um, looking at what the DC Court of Appeals has ruled, we have John Tyler, who I believe lives in the state of Maryland. I can't believe if he lives in Maryland or Virginia, but he's somewhere in the area. He was a hobby flyer who flew model aircraft who brought a lawsuit challenging to regulate the registration requirements for model aircraft. Um, here, the court ruled and agreed with him that FAA had no authority to do this, uh, but they did not overturn the requirements for commercial registration. So why care? Well, looking at this, currently, until President Trump signs a law in this bill into law, currently, hobby recreational users of UAVs do not have to register it. As of last night, as of yesterday, the Defense Authorization Act was passed. The Defense Authorization Act includes language that actually says, no, we actually meant to include hobby drone flyers to register. So if you're a hobby drone flyer, once that law goes into effect, you've got to register. 
Commercial drone operators are still going to have to register theirs before they use it in the operation. And if you buy it for recreational and end up using it for your business, you probably still have to register it as well. And that's it. We have the website. And then our department that AELI contributes to does this blog at agriscmanagement.umd.edu. Any questions? Colby, we should have just given you a mic. You just hold it the whole day. <laughs> uh, my question is very kind of timely with the drone question you just had. We've had a couple of farmers from Howard County that have reached out to us and asked us what what uh, rights they have with the use of drones over their properties. And the reason was is they're the they're in that mulching uh, issue right now, and some of the, the ones that are against you allowing agricultural mul mulching in Montgomery or in uh, Howard County have actually started flying drones over farms to take photos of the mulching processes on some of the farms, and they're asking us what they can do. Is there anything out there, or should, there, should, should something be done in the state? So to answer that, it's kind of a gray area as to how much space at times they're going to have over this. So prop, what needs to happen is the state's um, privacy laws have not been updated since the 70s. So there should be something there that could be done to kind of take this into account. But it's really nothing they can do at this point. Paul, you mentioned that if this is about the uh, circular reporting for poultry growers. So you mentioned that if a grower was able earlier in the week to submit by phone or email a initial continuous release notification. So if they did that and they got their unique number back, will they, I think you said they won't have to do it again after the mandate is issued. Is, is, that, is that right? And did you get that from like from the EPA hotline, and then secondarily, if, if that's true, when does their 30-day clock start to file their follow-up notification? Okay, I did not get that from calling EPA. I've been having people forward me information from livestock groups that have been heavily involved in it, and that clock for their 30 days will start running the second it's final. Once the final order is issued, they'll have 30 days from whatever that date is to get that paperwork in. And hopefully in the meantime, EPA and the livestock groups can work out better forms for people to fill out. I'm not sure if you all can answer this or not, but on the dicamba issue, you mentioned that um, before you'd be able to spray next year, there would have to be required training. Who's supposed to do the training? Or who, who's supposed to provide the training? So the EPA has not released um, the official rule yet. They just said they will require training. Um, most likely it will probably be whatever the state's Department of Ag decide, decides. So in some states they've actually let um, extension folks do the training. In other states it's been Department of Agriculture officials. So um, hopefully we'll post information about that as soon as the EPA does release the official rules. Um, I, I know the decision just came out this week and I haven't had a chance to look at it, um, but are you able to comment on uh, the first Murphy-Brown decision in Iowa that abrogated the right to farm rule in that state? No, I can't, I've probably <laughs> seen it, but I can't remember what it's about. <laughs> Top of my head. Anyone else? Questions? Seems like a lot of good reasons to subscribe to the Maryland Risk Management Education blog because we have a lot of things coming down the pike. So um, please go ahead and subscribe to that if you haven't yet because we will keep it updated with all of these issues. And with that, please help me thank Paul Kelly. <laughs> And
And at this point, it is down to me to provide a, a summation. I'm going to try to keep it short, so like 45, 50 minutes. Um, actually, I only have two things I would like to tell you at this point. The first is thank you all for attending today. Thanks for the engagement. We'd like you to continue that engagement, both in terms of using the ALEI resources and giving us feedback about ALEI overall in this conference in particular. You will get an evaluation via email. Uh, we would love to hear from you. We're always working to improve our program and to improve this conference. So please look for that. Please fill it out. Uh, the second is just a reminder. If you want nutrient management continuing education units, you need to sign the piece of paper outside on the registration table. Uh, with that, thank you so much. Please be in touch with us. Uh, and have a good weekend. Thanks for coming, Evan. Yeah. Good to see you.